Hey folks, Adam Summer here for the Heartland Pod, March 21st, 2022. We have a great show for you today, jam-packed with some midterm action, talking about Missouri's Medicaid expansion and its uh, failure to launch, so to speak. Uh, we're going to jump into Josh Hawley's $20 Made in China mug that he's going to use to catch all the liberal tears. Uh, and then we get into Mitt Romney's ominous warning and talk about Claire McCaskill and Jack Danforth and all kinds of stuff. Before that, I will have an opening statement for you on public service versus personal gain. Lots to get to, so let's go. Welcome back to the Heartland Pod. My name is Adam Summer. I am your host. For new listeners, thanks for joining us. We're glad you're here. We hope you'll come back and join us. Remember, if you've not yet hit the subscribe button to get our shows automatically and leave us a rating and review on the platform of your choice, please do that. It's going to help other folks looking for a show like this know that this is the place to be. So make sure you follow us on the socials. We're on Facebook and Instagram as the Heartland Pod. And on Twitter, you'll find us the most active there with at the Heartland Pod. Email us anytime, heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com. Lots of folks have been reaching out. I'm uh, setting up lots and lots of interviews. Uh, The midterms are picking up, and uh, it's a great thing to see. So questions or you just want some information on uh, how to get on the show, how to get scheduled, heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com is a great place to do that. Or, of course, the DMs are open over on Twitter as well. All right, this week's show, uh, we're going to talk midterms again. You know, obviously, midterms are going to be pretty hot and heavy over the next several months. So uh, we'll keep diving into that. It won't be every week, but we'll revisit it on a fairly regular basis. Uh, And essentially looking at the question of are things maybe trending up for the Democrats for the midterms? Not necessarily that they're going to win, but that is it maybe a little less automatic red wave type stuff, uh, maybe a little bit more of a contest. So uh, a question about that. Uh, Then a look at Missouri's Medicaid expansion and the complete and utter failure that's occurring right now uh, in the state. And then a buy or sell, we're going to talk about Josh Hawley's uh, $20 mugs, uh, and we have a good time with that one. And then the big one, uh, Mitt Romney at all, lots of folks uh, are saying this now. Um, you know, longtime listeners of this podcast uh, may recall that I've talked many, many, many times about uh, civility and politics and how we can have real conversations with our neighbors and about changing the conversation, right? Well, now the Republicans are starting to jump onto it. Um, but it's interesting the juxtaposition that that sort of brings up because you've got McCaskill and Danforth on this thing, and it's sort of put forward as McCaskill and Danforth call for everybody to be civil. And really, I think, and I think Claire's right about this, it, it's more of Jack Danforth, Mitt Romney, some other Republicans who are starting to see that, uh, you know, the the whole liberal tears thing, right? That that doesn't – it's short-term. It might do some good stuff for them for some short-term stuff. But that long-term, it's wearing thin and it, it's not necessarily the best way to go about things. So that's what we talk about in the big one uh, as well. Before all that, just a reminder, if you feel like you want to support what we're doing here, you can. We have a Patreon page for the Heartland Pod. Uh, We have at least two bonus episodes uh, every month over there called The Last Call, where we really do let loose on a topic and kind of have some fun with it. Uh, We also have a blog space called The Heartland News. At five bucks a month, you get access to both of those uh, and more. And uh, so lots of good stuff over there. You can be a part of the community. There's extra interaction over there. Uh, and we're talking about getting together, doing some live stuff now that uh, Rachel is going to be able to uh, socialize in person. So stuff is in the works, stuff that we wanted to do a long time ago. And then Delta variant, I'm, you know, it was just like, OK, we thought we were getting that direction and then things changed again and shifted. So uh, we're hoping that it holds this time and we can actually do that stuff and have some interaction with the folks who subscribe over, the, over there. And thank you very much to those of you who are subscribed. Uh, your support is amazing to us every time we see a new person sign up. Uh, I'm blown away every single time to see the support from folks and to know that, <clears throat> you know, something that can feel sometimes like just shouting into the void uh, more so than other things because I'm alone in my studio space. I'm talking to, um, well, you. Right. But <clears throat> at the moment, I'm talking to nobody. So thank you for coming. Uh, otherwise, this would be, you know, fairly troubling <laughs> to my friends and family that I just go, you know, once or twice a week and talk into a microphone and uh, there's nobody listening. So thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing. Thanks for helping us change the conversation. And now the opening statement. 
Public service versus personal gain. It's quite a balancing act in politics. When talking to so many folks running for office, I often learn about their desire to do good, to help others, to improve the overall condition of their fellow humans. In short, it's a, a call, right? It's a drive, a desire to be a public servant. And that is the essence of self-governance. For us as citizens to be willing to serve the needs of our community, our state, and our country. Service based not on what a person can do to improve their own bottom line, but rather the goal to create a rising tide lifting all boats in the process. Jean-Baptiste Rousseau said, As soon as public service ceases to be the chief business of the citizens, and they would rather serve with their money than with their persons, the state is not far from its fall. In short, selfish behavior and personal gain over the good works of service will lead us to a society of demagogues, profiteers, and grifters. Shiny presentation replaces substance. Dopamine-inducing sound bites replace substantive action. Politics becomes no more than saccharine sweet filler designed to placate. Platitudes delivered in a tweet like the latest pop song. Don't think too hard about the substance, you might be disappointed. Instead, let the melody infect you as the beat moves your feet with the cultivated 3 minutes and 25 seconds of joy, just begging to be shared, begging to replicate. Eventually, that sharing cycle runs its course, and like clockwork, a new hook, a new melody, a new platitude will arrive to begin the cycle again. Many Republicans have learned to move their message with an outrage cycle, while Democrats reach for the less easily obtained branch of self-righteous justification. Not that the sentiments or goals of either message are equal in value. They rarely, if ever, are. But the method and delivery is nearly identical. Provoke a response, outrage, agreement, passionate responses that move the fingers to share. And when you do that, to say why you share it, why you feel it, why do you do that exactly? Why do we have that response? Because sharing... Fundraising links, platitudes, right? They can increase a profile, but what good is it really doing? Where is the public service in a platitude? I know some would push back on this to say that you have to win to do the good things. You have to raise money to win, and and to a point, that is true. But it is a campaign about proving you can raise money and appear on television. Is that a campaign that's for public service? Or is that a campaign that's about personal gain? Is that a campaign that's about raising a profile? Personal gain or public service? For me, I choose the latter. Now here's Talking Politics. Talking Politics. All right, we are here for Talking Politics. I have Sean Diller, I have Rachel Parker. Uh, we had a great week uh, in the podcast world. Thanks to everybody for clicking and downloading and sharing and and make sure you're doing it again this week because the numbers are very, very good and midterms are coming. So let's keep pumping it up so we can keep reaching more and more folks uh, to do this change the conversation thing together. Speaking of together, Rachel Parker, thanks for being here again. And uh, how you doing? Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um I, I love that we don't even have to say which to put on anymore because everybody knows that it's coffee because it's coffee, like we're taping this in the morning. It's the morning, so it's coffee. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. So I'm doing good. I, I'll, I'll say that my my joke this morning is that I, I've been waking up the last few days. Uh, you guys know we're at the end of this slog of like our household living like it's been 2020 for the last yeah. ever. And I, I have to say officially that I didn't realize – just how much of an extrovert I am uh, until this. I mean, and, and plus, like before COVID, we had all kinds of stuff going on in our house that would make you feel isolated. If, even if I literally didn't have to isolate it, we still kind of were. When you're dealing with illness and surgeries and stuff, you're kind yeah. of you're kind of a ship at sea. Um, and then you come back to shore, and you're like, "What do you mean COVID?" And so then it just went on from there. So real ready, real ready to start seeing some folks again. Um, but this morning, I played a little game called. 
is that me being overwhelmed or is that menopause? Like I can't like, <laughs> cause the news is so like when you open the guardian app right now, um, right. Which is my go-to for headlines. And that may have to change. Not because I don't want to know about what's going on in Ukraine and not that I think that they should stop with their exhaustive Ukraine coverage. I think that's what the news is for is to document right. war crimes by a war criminal, but it's horrible to yeah. start your day like that. And so I used to like start the day with just like terrible headlines about Republicans. And now it's terrible headlines about Republicans buried under the lead of terrible news about Ukraine. Yeah. And then I have to be like, am I overwhelmed or is it just my lady times? <laughs> uh, and this morning I couldn't tell. So I'm just, I'm just rolling with it. I'm just happy to be here. Frankly, <laughs> I'm not going to spend too much time thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad to have you. You mentioned Thank before you. we started recording, though, about Russia, the frontline piece. What, oh, um, Putin's war. Yeah. Putin's war. Putin's war, frontline. So good. Quick hour. Um, it's not one of the front lines that takes, like, you know, two and a half grueling hours of your life to just, like, slog through a horrible <laughs> story about Jeffrey Epstein or something where you're just like, I can't anymore. Yeah. It's so hard. Um, uh, there is something buried in the story that I didn't realize that uh, after there was a school that was held hostage, uh, that was, excuse me, that was, that was basically, there was like a hostage uh, situation at a school this many years ago. And Putin's response will give you a lot of information about him and makes kind of the initial reporting about him in the lead up to war about like, well, if we would just, if Ukraine would just like not join NATO and right. if we just hadn't pushed like, yeah, there's some validity to that. I'm not saying there isn't, but like, it it it's, it does such a good job of like putting you in the head of this person, and that like it's a little bit like saying that Nancy Pelosi could have made Donald Trump less of an incompetent racist or something. Like you, <laughs> there's like you, if there somebody like that's always going to be is right. always going to be shifting the discussion to make it look like they were the victim because right. that's what he wants to be. He wanted to believe that he's been victimized by that. It's, it's really good. Anyway, check it out, and then you'll know more about than your friends do about the Ukraine war. Sean Diller, man, how are you doing? And uh, yeah, how how the week treats you? Uh, I'm doing really well. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's. Um, and we should say a, a wonderful flyover on Friday. You and Kevin put so together solid, a, man. A hell of a show. Oh, People, thanks. if you're Just not getting, listening yeah. to that, it's really good. Like it's so quick, and it's like a cup of coffee full of just useful stuff on your Friday. Yeah. And it's just so like, or I listen to it. Uh, I listen to it Saturday. So I'm taking yeah, a little walk. Work Saturday. Oh. And what I love about what you guys have managed to kind of get the groove going over over the last few months is that it's it's the spoonful of sugar right like mm-hmm. it's you're, you're just like and sean's like buoyant little voice and kevin's like <laughs> i did theater in high school voice <laughs> um like i can sometimes i can so hear kevin going sometimes like when he's doing when he's like reading quotes i can hear him being like all right so what's my motivation here what am, what am i doing like <laughs> right, you just hear the right. actor in him but that's a good thing because it makes these just sometimes very difficult things that you guys talk about just yeah. go down easier. And then you have the information. That's the whole point. And I love it. I love yeah, it. Cool. Thanks. No. Yeah. It's really been fun to do. And it shows the difference in all of the the Midwest or like, what well, you know, we kind of, uh, totally. You know, like we take offense to the term flyover country. I think it's like the idea of taking it back. You yeah, know? yeah. Totally. But, but, you know, absolutely. Minnesota and Colorado are doing really, really cool stuff. And then like some of the, super conservative states are doing some really alarming stuff. And then by doing this almost like beat reporting, which we really take a lot from the state's newsroom project, which is this mm-hmm. really neat independent journalism, that national is. effort. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then we can cherry pick also like when the Oklahoma state legislature does something super progressive on criminal justice reform or something. Um, cause we're looking for it all the time. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, this has been a fun weekend. We went to the park yesterday I've got these two little girls that are just the best. So the weekends are the best. Parks are good. Parks are a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a, an interesting week. I turned 37 and, uh, I didn't know it was your birthday. birthday. How did I miss your birthday? Well, you know, 37 is one of those, you just sort of, it just happens, right? (laughs) Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's the, uh, Sort of comes the, and goes. The Bill Burr bit about like we should only is it Bill Burr where you should only yeah. celebrate these birthdays and like yeah after it's after like thirty or like years just, and yeah, then eventually after, it's five years again once you get past a certain age yeah, yeah no yeah. absolutely yeah but happy thirty seventh I yeah, had a good nice. year thirty thirty seven was weird but I I remember thirty seven being the year that I was like 
I really want to be this person forever. You know what right. I mean? Like 37, right. I was like, find, figured it out. Yeah. yeah. Like I did a couple of other things that I thought were kind of stupid, like not major, but like things where I felt kind of embarrassed or things where I was like, and I was like, I, you know what? I'm just going to tweak that. And I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to be this chick forever. Right. Though. I'm right. happy with this. This That's is like good. I told some students, you know, through the years about, you know, your twenties, like do everything you can to impress people. Cause like, once you get to your thirties, like it's very hard to impress people. You know, it's like in your twenties, if you're like a really steady Eddie who always shows up and, you know, has a job and has their shit such together. A sharp, such yeah, a sharp, sharp young like, man. Yeah. Such they're a just sharp really young man. Doing so yeah. in your thirties, just like, congratulations, you're an adult. You're an adult now. Right. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah, of course you went to work today. What else were you going to do? Anyway, well, let's jump into the segments here. All right, the true or false, uh, the Democrats' chances of holding both chambers in 2022 in the midterms is actually trending up, true or false? Um, I, I will lead it off just by saying I think it's actually true that it's trending up. I don't – I'm not – this question is not are they going to, just that is the chance becoming better, right, that they could. Um, and I do think it's trending up uh, based on some – 538 uh, reporting based on some of the things we're seeing, some of the sort of straw grabbing that I think we're starting to see from some of these extreme uh, Republican candidates. Uh, you know, there's some some other indicators that we'll talk about. So I think it's trending up. Uh, I think it still looks like the Republicans have a very good election coming in the fall for them, as one would expect in a midterm uh, for a new president. But I do think it's trending up. Sean Diller, uh, give us give us the the deep dive here. Yeah. So I'll say false. First of all, I don't think the okay. Democrats, I don't think the Dems chances of holding the house is trending up and really, you know, I wasn't a math major, nor did I take any math courses in college. <laughs> um, but That's I almost nice have like a statistical baby. thing with 538, you know, just being from Missouri, you look at the middle of that map that they have where they're counting up all the competitive seats and they, they don't have Missouri's counted because the maps aren't finalized yet. There's no map, yeah. <laughs> right. And so we already know that there's going to be at least six Republican seats, you mm-hmm. know, that aren't even particularly competitive. And so if you just tack that on to the to the number that the 538 folks have been putting right. together for the Republicans, then it then now it's bigger than the Democrats. And so there are four states that haven't finished their maps. Therefore, they're not in this count. Right. And so it's Missouri, Los An- uh, Missouri, Louisiana, Florida, and New Hampshire, right? New which Hampshire. all have Republican legislatures. Right. So. And, and Louisiana and Florida, you just figure that's going to be a ton of Republican seats almost for sure. Right. Right. And three of the four, Excepting Florida, you know, our lower population, um, mm-hmm. but they are all GOP states. So, and then the one thing I will say, though, what's somewhat consistent with other years. So I think it's the same as it was before. So I think it's kind of static right now. What people are really thinking about is gas prices, inflation, mm-hmm. and yeah. the war in Ukraine. And so, you know, we can watch Biden's approval rating. We can watch economic indicators. And then, you know, these 33 highly competitive seats you know, what I'm always looking for is like, what's, what's going to emerge as the question of the election that swing voters are asking themselves because the number of toss up seats, if it's 35 or 33, they're not going to split evenly. They're not going to go half and half. They're going to move in a wave. Um, Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And the Biden approval did touch up to 43 this past week, um, you know, on the 538 uh, where you, where you take the average polling, um, it, you know, we'll we'll see long term what that means. Um, there is the 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 Eric Schmidt article, Rachel, that you <laughs> shared with us that sort of highlights that desperate times thing that I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So Schmidt decided. So our attorney general has been using his um, role as the most powerful law enforcement officer in Missouri as the as a bully pulpit to uh, sue schools to show that he's tough on COVID, like COVID's a person Um, and not tough on COVID. Like we need to get vaccinated and do everything we can to stop it spread tough on COVID. Like we need to show those liberals that we don't believe in science. Um, So he dismissed, he decided himself that he was going to dismiss a whole bunch of 
uh, the lawsuits against school districts this week. I think there's only like six that are still in play. Right. And they are getting ready to all they're getting ready to lift all their mask mandates, which he's taking credit for. Um, right. The reason they're lifting their mask mandates has nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with the fact that COVID trends are going um, in, the, in, a, in a positive direction for the first time. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say what is true is that we're going to see millions of headlines between now and November about what the Democratic cha- about what the Democrats' chances are mm-hmm. of holding on to the House and Senate because uh, it seems like the only thing that people talk about during the midterms is like can there will there will there be a blue wave or won't there be a blue you know so that's right. true. Um, I'm furious with the. Um, Republican legislatures that seem hell bent on proving that democracy can't work. Uh, that seems to be kind of their big thing right now is like, if we show them it doesn't work, then they'll continue. Then us be voters will continue to be really right. cynical about midterm elections, which seems to be part of the point at least. Um, so like Sean said, we don't have a congressional map yet because of a bunch of assholes, literally a bunch, <laughs> like it's a bunch, like you could like tie a band around them and like give them away. It's a gift. Like here's a bunch of assholes wouldn't approve a congressional map yet. Yeah. So yeah. that's going to be mustard cool. greens is what yeah. I'm imagining. <laughs> that's exactly. No, they're not, <laughs> they're not farm, like, farmer's market season is starting and that's exactly what I was imagining. Right. Like, do not, broccoli band. Do not besmirch <laughs> mustard greens, sir. Mustard greens have never done not. a thing to you. No, my um, grandparents survived on mustard greens during the dust bowl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love a I love a mustard green. I think it's more like a bunch of like when you're like when you see those the the hardworking people that work for the the whatever the I'm not sure what division they work for in the city, but they're cleaning up the medians like right. in the city and they're, they're pulling up a bunch of like crap. That's like dead and gross. That's what I'm seeing in my head. Just like dead, gross stuff. Anyway, we don't have a congressional map yet. We're not going to be re- like we're, we are running the risk also of not being ready for our own primary, yeah. um, which is ridiculous and a waste of time and yeah. stupid. And also in Missouri kind of pointless because right. you know, we know that it's these seats are going to be gonna safely. Anything. <laughs> yeah. Like what, like, uh, you know, I'm a great admirer of, of two of the three people that are running in Missouri second district, for example, which is the bulk of St. Louis right. County. And I don't think that either one of them can be an Ann Wagner. I love them both. I love Ray Reed. I love Trish. I want them to work their asses off. I will do what I can to help them, even though I'm, I don't live there. Um, and I think that they will give her a good run for either one of them. I think could give her a solid run for her money. That doesn't mean I don't think that she's going to win. Right. Like right. it's a, so all of this strum and drong is always going to be what's going on. Right. Um, uh, and right now, like, you know, like you mentioned uh, the, the country always looks at the president at like, well, all of this is all you, on you, right? Exactly. So if things are good, yeah. the president's like got high approval ratings. So right now, like, yeah, we're still going through like a really rough patch. We're still, you know, feeling, I was reading an, a, a report that I had up in my, a, my browser tab that I forgot was open about the Suez Canal disaster. And like, mm-hmm. we cannot under, we cannot undermine. We're still feeling the effects of yes. one ship getting stuck in a canal. Like, well, because, yeah, because like still. all the other ships were like, like, right. you know, I think we were, I think the the cost was like ten billion a day. Yeah. Uh. So you know, like, there's all kinds of. So you know, I don't know. Is it trying to up right now? Sure. Why not? Sure. True. Great. <laughs> Whatever. So one of the things that I was looking at when I was coming up with this, the Cook Political Report. Um. You know, th- th- they've got it slotted with um essentially twenty toss ups right now, but they're still the ones to come. Um, but more importantly, so, you know, stepping away from the House and going over to the Senate side, they've only got the five Senate seats in the toss up. We talked about this more extensively last week, but this is sort of a tag on at the end here. Um, you know, they've got Wisconsin, Nevada, Arizona, Pennsylvania and Georgia. Those are the only toss ups that Cook uh, Political Report is putting out there. Um, and it is important, I think, for folks to look at it and realize that Missouri in most serious places – Missouri is rated as a strong R, not a lean, not a likely, a strong R. Um, and, you know, for the Senate seat. And if that's going to be the case, you know, obviously, depending on who gets the the nomination for the Republicans could change that. But if that's going to be the case, if it's going to be a strong R, now we're getting into those questions of primaries. And like you're saying, you know, getting ready, being ready for a primary. And, you know, who do you run in a race like that where, you know, if you're going to – if the, if the tea leaves say you're going to lose the race or you're likely going to lose the race, then 
who do you run in a race like that? Who's your standard bearer? And I think there's a there's several seats where that's a, a good question to ask, not just Missouri, but um, you know, who are you putting in these seats? And more do importantly, putting people in the seats. Do you mean Pennsylvania and Ohio? Is that what you mean? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, in for Pennsylvania, sure. at least, is yeah. more of an open race, right? Yeah. So that that one maybe is even more important. But certainly, Ohio is a good example where making sure that you've got a Democrat in the seat that isn't going to hurt, you know. Missouri, Ohio, places like that need to have a Democrat that can not only keep from hurting the party in that state, but could also maybe help, you know, lift the tide of the local races. Uh, you Correct. Know, we all saw this week, uh, it went around Missouri political Twitter, uh, that there's a ton of open seats at the state level that, that we hope people will sign up uh, and fill. And, and, you know, you sign up, we'll put you on the show. You know, sign up and email heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com. Get a friend to sign up and give them that email address. We'll put them on the show. We'll get them out there so that folks can find them. Like for Sean, candidates? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And what do you yeah. think about that, Sean, as far as like like if you're running a state race or, right. you know, a statewide, whether it's a statewide or a smaller, you know, state seat, how important would it be to you from an analyst side of things, you know, f- to have somebody on the ticket that isn't, is more than a character, right? Somebody who actually is going to be out there working, working right. the state. In terms of like, what kind of outcome? What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in terms of giving the best shot for the smaller races. Gotcha. Like down ballot, like how much yeah. does the top of the ticket in a midterm affect down ballot races? Yeah, so like in Missouri, yeah. right, the biggest race in Missouri 2022 is the Senate race. Right. So like how much would that, you know, whoever gets picked by the Democrats to run in that race, how do you think that has influence on the rest yeah. of those races? So less in a midterm would definitely okay. be the short answer. And the reason for that is turnout drops off in a midterm. And so the people who end up voting – it's not random. It's the people who are, um, you know, more in tune, less mm-hmm. likely to be swing voters. And um, so the the local candidates, I think, can benefit from spending. So when I think about Arizona and the amount of money that's going to just be dumped in for Mark Kelly and right. in the governor's race, um, you know, I think that has an impact. So the top, you know, the fundraising potential and kind of how the party leadership feels about the top of the ticket can definitely have an impact. Um, but yeah, we didn't move all the way past Eric Schmidt, did we? I wanted to make sure and talk. I no, have we a can circle back. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to, you know, insult posit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say, say really critical, nasty things about what an asshole he is. Go ahead, Sean Tiller. No, I don't. That's, that's not how I, that's not ever what I do. Um, <laughs> I wanted to take a walk through the numbers, of course, and Think about yeah. why. Where's this coming from? Why would Eric Schmidt sue the Rockwood School District again when he sued them over Mass before, and now he's suing them over this thing? Where That's true. we didn't mention sunshine, that he's suing yeah, them he's for suing sunshine, them for the sunshine yeah. law. Yeah, right. Which is funny. Yeah. And for so like, people, let me. Sorry. Let me. Sorry. One more second. So I'm just going to set up that Rockwood is in a very conservative part of St. Louis County. Like it is a, a Trump plus plus a million. Um, district. And so it's interesting that he's picking that one to sue for sunshine law requests, which is ridiculous. It's a really strange case uh, that probably won't go anywhere, but I just wanted to make sure that like we set it up that he's suing a school district full of parents that vote for Republican candidates consistently. All right, go ahead. Sorry. All right. Well, I'll push back on that (laughs) right away too. It's, it's not as Republican as a lot of other parts of Missouri. It is population dense for sure. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's the largest school district in St. Louis County. And I just think Eric Schmidt is, a, a a little baby, a whiny baby. Who's afraid of everybody knowing that he's, he's not a man. He's not, he's not a man like, <laughs> uh, like the superintendent is. Uh, and so I just started looking to see what, what might pop up and, uh, the superintendent, let's start with money, right? Um, <laughs> the superintendent makes, it looks like 285 or no, $235,000 superintendent of Rockwood. Um, anyone want to guess what the AG of Missouri makes? 133. Oh, he wishes. It's lower? Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that. Bum, bum, I thought bum, it would bum. be pretty close to like a county prosecutor. Um, yeah, no. Um 116. Wow. 
Yeah. Guess what the budget? So the budget of the Rockwood School District in terms of manliness, $285 million. Uh-huh. Uh, guess what the budget of the Missouri AG's office is? <laughs> God, this is a price. This is a price is right. Do we need a new drop? I feel like we need a new <laughs> drop for this. Higher or lower? Higher or lower? Seven. It's four. It's forty two million dollars. Um, wow. Yeah. So he's wow. just wow. showing those. So he's just bucket. showing those suburban where he's from. Uh, suburban. Like I think, he, and he liberals. has a name ID problem. Yeah, I think he is sure. desperate, but I think there's also some personal right, stuff. Because his name is also know. Eric. I just think right, like right. I just think for him like this is such a stupid like so eventually you're going to run into a Republican school teacher in Rockwood and this should be a safe R district right Well there are 2200 staff members in that school district because Right <laughs> and th- the chances are they voted for Trump the the great the vast Money majority of them, of them sure. probably yeah. voted for Trump um uh I mean again like we are not talking about a woke part of St. Louis County at all uh, my parents live there. My my sisters went through Rockwood School District. My stepmom worked in Rockwood School District. Like this is a conservative part of St. Louis County. Um, so I don't know why pissing off educators in a safely read like isn't there any other way that you could communicate with them, bro? Like any other way that you could just like show up and be like, "How are you guys doing? Thanks so much for the work that you've done for, over the last few years. I know it's been brutal. How are your kids? How are you holding I mean, up?" If you like, have to find a real, yeah, electoral reason, he must be thinking of Virginia and Pennsylvania and just the energy, you know, behind hostility towards the schools. But I guess, yeah, I don't know. I guess, but it, anyway. yeah, but those are. I don't think that energy can last long enough to get him where he wants to go. I just think people are going to get tired of attacking teachers, and people are going to lose interest. And they're going to see in, pictures in of Eric Greitens, and they're going to be like, look at his pretty blue eyes. Right. Like, right. they don't... Right. And they're going to look at Eric Schmidt's videos of him standing around with a bunch of, like, racist, like, people... You know, again, like we're talking about. We also about- haven't seen the ballot either. Like, it'll be really interesting what order they're in on the ballot because if Schmidt's first, like all they should do until until primary election day, if he's first on the ballot, is just say vote Eric. And also, like I'm the <laughs> Attorney General of Missouri. Just shh, that's all you have to say. It worked right. for Howley, idiot. Okay, I'm done right. with Schmidt. I'm done. I've literally. met Josh Hawley, and Eric Schmidt is no Josh Hawley. The haircut alone. Ooh, <laughs> coming for the baldness, bro. I mean, I look at probability. That's all. <laughs> okay, all right. Fair enough. Fair let's, enough. Let's move on. Yeah, no. Yeah. All right. The yeah, no. Uh, this one is super hyper Missouri. Um, so Missouri expanded Medicaid because the voters voted to do that uh, back in 2020. And then 2021, the state legislature. Spent the year pitching a fit. It was, uh, I believe we passed Medicaid expansion in 2018, I believe is when we actually did it. Yeah. Right. But then the, the, the new version of it, the, 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 the bigger expansion in 2020 that went through by the, uh, uh, the actual ballot measure. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. No, you're it, right. It expanded yeah. the formula in 2020. Um, oh, got it. And the legis- state legislature then said, we're not going to fund it. We won't do it. And then they they pitched that fit for a while, and they lost uh, in court, as many people uh, were saying, including myself, um, many people, smartest people. And so they lost. And so the program now exists. The program now is supposed to have funding and all that stuff. A uh, piece on the Missouri Independent that came out on the 16th, uh, really good reporting by Rebecca Rivas and Tessa Weinberg about it. And essentially now if you sign up for and, – and I talked about some of this with uh, – I had Spencer on last week, uh, Spencer Toter, talking about they're, they're doing this Medicaid enrollment program through, through their campaign, which I think is really cool. And so it got me looking at the Medicaid stats and how it's going right now and it's going uh, bad. So they're essentially leaving it to just rot on the vine. So that's my – yeah, no, is, is I think that the governor is just essentially looking at it and saying – well, how do I make my people happy? How can we say we're fighting back? Is we'll just we'll just leave it alone. So yeah, no. This is a guy who, and I'm sure Rachel, you know more about this than me, but the stats are ridiculous with how long and compared to other states because it's not just Missouri that has Medicaid. Everyone's right, you know, administering this program. Missouri's just doing it worse and leaving people without coverage for longer, meaning they don't go 
to the doctor because they can't pay the bill that they know they're going to get. It's like, that's why this is so important. And the federal um, law says it's yeah. supposed to take 45 days, 45 days yeah, to require somebody through, a, yeah. the, through the system. And right now it's over a hundred in Missouri. It, when the story came out, it was at 99. Um, and uh, Sarah Onsicker, representative, state representative, put out on Twitter. She she had a really nice explainer about how it's worse. Yeah, it's it's, really it's good. already worse than that. Right. Really a couple good. of days later. Yeah. But like Parson, you know, when all these COVID tests came and they were just in, you know, big garages and, you know, miles. warehouses, his actual quote and plan was like, well, we need to find some way for companies to sell these to Missourians basically. Right. And that'll right. get them out of the garage. And it's like, well, who's even working on that? Like, yeah. what the hell are you doing? <laughs> we need to find a way to turn um, a profit so, here, folks. We, yeah. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> and that's about the same time he said, we need to get out of the business. Get out of the business of COVID. Right, right. And by the way, how much can we sell these COVID tests for? <laughs> right. <laughs> Rachel. I mean, I what how much more yeah, no can you get than mm. this? Um uh I don't even know where to start, to be honest. I'm so so we should mention that Spencer Toter, for people that don't know who we're talking about, is a very hardworking, um, very grassroots uh candidate for on the Democratic Senate side of the primary and he's using his campaign as an instrument of social change, which I think is mm-hmm. and social justice, which I think is like mm, a chef's kiss. Like I, I want more people. I think that's an example of how Democrats have to run campaigns. Cause if you're likely to lose both the primary and the general, why not use your campaign as a genuine platform, which I have talked about many times in this podcast. What I mean is what he's doing. I just want to clarify how awesome I think that is because it's actually like, well, if we're here, we right. have campaign staff, we have some donors, we have some stuff. Let's make some, let's, let's deal with the community. Yeah, people and are willing what, to listen to you because you're out there saying, that's right. You have a, an excuse and to forbid, talk to people. You catch people. lightning in a bottle in the process. You never right. know. Right. right. So the, the idea that the Republicans in Missouri have that nobody wants healthcare, that healthcare is this like hot, it's the, it's the one thing that actually is bipartisan. The one thing that is bipartisan is healthcare. Yeah. They pretend like it's not. It is. Um, the to to see somebody like this is a yeah no into and of itself. So Caleb Browden, the Senate Majority Leader here in Missouri, I, I don't know if this was this week or last week, is fuming because he couldn't get Medicaid expansion approved in the budget. They finally did. Right. It was a gnarly battle by that same bunch of assholes I was talking about earlier right. who will not get mentioned. I won't say their names. Fuck you. You don't get any more shine from me. Um, <laughs> that he said, well, I didn't want this stuff, but you know, the voters approved it. So we get it. Like to say, I don't want this stuff is doing such a disservice to how much they fought Medicaid expansion yeah. for d- the better part of a decade and almost a half, right? Like they yeah. wouldn't pass it through the legislature because that was part of the, one of the kind of the fault lines of Obamacare, the affordable care act. So, I, you know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. I don't care what the governor says. We're still, we're maybe we're at the, we're in the third act of it, but it's not an endemic. It's not endemic yet. There are still sick people. There are still people that need things like, Oh, I don't know. Cancer screenings. Mm-hmm. And, regular screenings and access to doctors because something hurts and they don't know why, or because they have a sore throat and they want to make sure it's not COVID and to pretend, which it seems to be kind of the MO of the general Missouri Republican party to pretend like this isn't really still a problem and to pretend like people that are living below a certain income threshold. And by the way, before Medicaid expansion, Missouri had the lowest a uh, qualification for Medicaid in the country, meaning that you had to be like 60% below what the federal government considers the poverty right. line to qualify for Medicaid or something like right. that. It was like you had to make no, like 18. The, what it was, what, the way it worked is if you make more than like $4,000, you don't qualify for Medicaid. Right. There you it was, go. It was a joke. Right. It, it was a complete it's joke. Pathetic. It's pathetic. So, so the, the system has been drained, right? The healthcare system in Missouri has been drained of resources for far longer than this Medicaid conversation started. Yeah. And, and to just like, it's just, uh, I don't, it's not even the only people who were like, yeah, are relatively well-off people who live in the suburbs that have healthcare already. That's who's like, that's who's like, that's who's like dislocating their own shoulder to pat themselves in the back about how successful this like tough on Medicaid thing is. Uh, And I don't know people who think the hardest part of 
of <laughs> dealing with the doctor is making sure you have the app that gets you an extra 10% off your prescriptions that you're just going to go and fill at, at your Walgreens anyway. Right. So uh, that you won't I'm, think twice about paying for. So like they, I'm, they didn't have no clue about the people that you're talking about. Right. Exactly. And also, like they kicked off like how many like it's Sarah Unsicker was like very much on this too. Speaking of last year when they missed or was it was it earlier this year? I don't know. I can't remember. It's all bleeding together. This bullshit they do that they kicked off ceremony unceremoniously kicked off like tens of thousands of poor children off of Medicaid. Like what is wrong with you, man? Yeah. All right. I'm done. That's it. Yeah, I'm done. No. I could talk about this yeah. all day, and I don't want to. That's why it's the <laughs> NO. That's can what, it just be a pass? Just pass? Just like <laughs> that's why it fits right in the NO. Let's 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 move it on. All right, the buy or sell. Uh, <laughs> so George it's Harley, George Harley has this twenty dollars mug. George Harley that's made in China, and it has apparently, according to him. According to Georgie himself, it has triggered the liberals so badly and filled that coffee mug that's made in China for $20 on George's campaign website that's made in China that it has triggered the liberals' tears to fill that mug so badly that Politico, Politico, recently bought by a company in Germany known for right-wing connections, wants him to stop using their image on his mug because they're kowtowing to the liberal woke Tear in and this my is according beer, to Josh, Josh Holly. Holly George, yeah, George. Is He's saying fixed. they want me to not do my mug. Yes, because they're cats howling to the baby? liberal woke mob. Yes. what a baby. Yes, yeah. So buy or sell that the reason that Politico wants him to stop using their image. Well, I already his campaign mug. Even though there are three links, I'll tell you that in my homework, I didn't read any of these ones by protest when I saw the story. So <laughs> I'll keep mine short. Um, but yeah, what a I baby. Shared it. I shared it. Just I don't care about like... your mug, Josh. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason I wanted the story in the, in the show. Is so I could hear Sean react like this. That's all. That's This is all so for my selling. own amusement. <laughs> So Sean is selling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I oh, got to sell it good. as well. It, it's good. so stupid. Yeah, it was the Guardian so, piece that kicked it off. And then, yeah. like, I went down the rabbit hole. Read, read, the, Guardian, was, he, read the Guardian headline. It's great. <laughs> the Guardian headline is, Mugshot, Republican Josh Hawley told to stop using January 6th fist salute photo. So it's normally so I would say I want to make out with the person who wrote that headline, but I think at my age, that's probably becoming less and less appealing to somebody. Um, right now I would say like, I will, I will buy you. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one of our own. I'll give you your own George merch. So whoever wrote that headline, if they want to reach out, I'll give you some of our Heartland pod, George merch, some old school George merch. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's hilarious. So, so George took the picture of him saluting, the mob, the the mob that invaded the Capitol moments later yep. um, on January 6th, like, you guys keep the good fight right. up because he's such a... What is he again, Sean? Can you just continue to oh, tell me? Oh, a Nazi? Fascist? I don't know. Over, a baby. Uh, did I lose a little needle dick. You've caused him so many things. I just... I've, the mind boggles with the creative insults that you've levied, understandably, towards, uh, towards our George. Um, so he decided that he's so proud of his secessionist um, Nazi fuck ways that he put the image on a mug and the description on his website and he was selling it at first he was selling it at some, at, I think Lincoln days, right? We talked yep. about the stupid mug at Lincoln days. We talked about it, not because of the mug. Cause who cares? We talked about it because Billy long called him out. <laughs> called him out. I was like, it's made in right. China. And I was but like, right. Oh he said they were God, frantically I'm trying to take the stickers exhausted. off the bottom. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So, so uh, the description of the mug on the website is like, buy it so you can capture liberal tears. And so, mm -hmm. like, dude, shut the fuck up. Um, so, uh, I don't remember what this is supposed to be. What am I? I, I forget, like, even what the drop was that we're talking about. This. It's so funny. It's like, obviously, it's they're the ones that are always so upset. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway, because yeah, God, well, I don't when you even get the whole liberal tears thing. It's like, they're the I mean, ones who are so upset. Yeah, it's it's the manufactured <laughs> it's the manufactured outrage thing, right? Yes. It's the, yeah. exactly what it is. I re, I I remember uh, some comment that I got years ago before 
people when people could still pretend like we weren't a divided nation um i think like if you're any kind of uh female a, a person of any stripe um biological or otherwise you're pretty fucking aware of how divided this country is on some level if you're a person of color if you're uh non-gender non-gender conforming queer etc you're already pretty aware of how divided the country is uh but at some point i made some comment somewhere probably on social media i might even been like in a comment section but when that was still the only place that you could observe how racist and annoying people oh, are man remember comment sections back before they all figured out facebook yeah yeah and so, and I criticized W and I was like, he's a war criminal. Cause he was, and Dick Cheney is a war criminal. Cause he is blah, blah, blah. And somebody's like, I thought you liberals were supposed to be accepting. And I was like, what of, of, of garbage people? Like, what right. are you talking about? Like, so the idea that liberals have been weak, you know, that like, because we're so generous or whatever, I don't know what the fuck it means. I don't care. Right. Trump um, won Missouri by 19 points. Josh won it by four. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. thank you. God. Thank you. <laughs> right. I don't have anything else to say. He's a dick, whatever. Yeah, so I guess we're all, I hope we're all I'm so excited, though. The idea that he can't sell these after his campaign, which isn't, he's not even up for re election yet. Um, he could have just done nothing. He could have done right. nothing. He could have just been like, well, whatever. I'm just going to show up to Lincoln Days and like wave at people and endorse Vicky Hartzler and pose for the Photoshop. For, 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 excuse me, pose for the photo op in my man vest and my man <laughs> shoes. My yeah, man no, boot. he is now living the Mike Birbiglia stand up special. What I should have said was nothing. Right. Exactly. I should have just kept my mouth shut. So they're going to have to trash all these mugs and they're going to have to like get rid of all of their merch because it's a copyright violation, bro. Oh my God, you're a lawyer. You should know what that means. I'm done. Thank you very much. Well, he went to law school. All right, let's move on to the big one. And now the big one. All right, the big one. Uh, it's really a combination of several things, but I'm going to kick it off with, I'll call it Mitt Romney's ominous warnings about where things are headed in this country. Like he just fucking figured it out. <laughs> like, like he had Mitt nothing, Ryan. like he had nothing to do with it. Like bringing Paul Ryan yeah. into mainstream politics is not part like, and is not an ingredient in how we get whatever. It's Sorry. like he just hasn't been on the internet in like seven years. Like he, he like well, we randomly should also, woke up one morning, got his yeah. coffee, and was like, I'm going to check out this whole iPad fad and <laughs> and grabbed an <laughs> iPad and was like, so you just you just click here and they just give you all the in- – this is all horrible. Where's all the good stuff? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's not every day that Adam Summer makes me laugh as hard as Sean Diller does. That was like, – because the thing is like – I'm pretty sure that's probably true. That's exactly how it went, right? <laughs> yeah, his like his what does he have? Because he he's a more he's got like eight million kids and like eight million right. grandkids and like one of them like what you right. doing there? Like it's called a video game, Grandpa. Well, it just looks I think good. he had all sons. Yeah, so I think it must have been a granddaughter who was like, right. "We're kind of freaked out, Grandpa." And he's like, "What? Why?" <laughs> and like I'm positive it included him in a pair of like like pretty nice chinos and a very nice tucked in shirt. Bending over and slapping his legs on his knees, <laughs> <laughs> or his hands on his knees, like what you was got it, there? What let you me, got there, let sport? me. Is it what? Which house of his was this happening in? Like, was it the? Was it the Aspen house? La Jolla, um, was it the, yeah. the yeah. La Jolla place? Okay, great. <laughs> That's what we think about the, climate a lot. Yeah, over the <laughs> overlooking the ocean, thinking like, will this house be here in ten years? I don't know. I'll be dead. It doesn't matter. I'm right. Romney. <laughs> he starts scrolling the Guardian one day. Yeah, I think this is, it's the same story. I put it together with the Danforth, McCaskill, Cheney, yes. Romney. Like these names are all from the same decade. I love that we know. have, yeah. I love that Which we haven't the, even really said what the story is yet. We're just talking shit about how, how Mitt Romney just noticed that there might be a problem in America. Yeah, <laughs> so also th- right. there's a Guardian story that popped up. So Mitt Romney warned. And actually, Maybe I got some media layoffs need of, to hit them. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I actually got there because of the McCaskill-Danforth thing from the Missouri Independent. That's what led me down the rabbit hole um, because McCaskill and Danforth were together for an event uh, for Stevens College in Columbia and said they're, they were not giving up on this democracy um and then Romney, <laughs> the piece in the Guardian. Well, no, they're not giving up on civility. civility That's what they're not right, giving right. up on. And so uh, Romney said, uh, uh, "We are really the only significant experiment in democracy, and preserving liberal democracy is an extraordinary challenge." 
Um, and you know, he, he's kind of in that same cloth of the, the Cheney Kinzinger, like it, you know, it, it's, it's a political calculation, right? He's looking at the tea leaves. I think Mitt Romney's about to run for president is what I think. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, I think a lot of people would be very open to Mitt I'm Romney shaking my, I'm shaking my head really hard at that. That, that he's going to run gonna, or that it's No, I don't think he's going to do it again. No way. Why not? I'm curious about that. He did it before. Why would you want to do that again? It's awful. Like he can just go off. He's rich. Joe Biden he ran for d- like my whole life. No, but he was right. the candidate though. Like he actually, he actually yeah. did the whole thing. And he, he is ran, from like, Delaware. When you think mm, about the family thing. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Go I ahead. thought he lived but in yeah, Utah. I'm with you. I don't know. If I'm he lives in Utah yeah. now. But like, I, you know, I don't, I don't see him. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, I think that he knows what wing of the party he wants to try and prop up. And I think that's what it's about. I think he wants to help Liz Cheney and yeah. her chances to become the presidential nominee. So he's trying to sound like they're trying to like find this Republican classic lane. Right. Um, I guess. And then he's certainly safer doing. than a lot of other Republicans. He, you know, Utah, when they were looking at like what well, Mike Lee last time won by like, I don't know, however many points you can, like however many points you're allowed right. to win by. All the makes... Utahns. <laughs> <laughs> Utes. Oh, that's right. <laughs> the two Utes. The two hot. Um, so, yeah, what about Claire and Danforth, uh, Rachel? How does that give you the warm and fuzzies? Well, okay, let me first of all say that so the the Guardian piece that will be in the show notes where Romney's yeah. like this where we really need to protect democracy. Let me ask Sean Diller a question. Did these are two people who voted for Donald Trump twice? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, A, so you cared so much about democracy that neither of you voted for Joe Biden. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um the other thing that I would like to say about Mitt Romney, and I'm going to ask, and Liz Cheney, uh, since they're both so concerned about democracy and the preservation of it and decency and civility and all these other things that they all like to talk about so much, uh, did either of them vote for any of the voting rights legislation that died in the Senate? Sean Diller, go ahead. Yes or no? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Yeah, they did I, not. So, yeah. all right. So they're concerned so that felt about like a setup. Yeah, so they're they're <laughs> concerned about democracy, but they're not going to do anything to actually protect it. They're just going to make stump speeches because they think there is an opening for Liz Cheney in the Republican Party. And like, right. okay, although I really do feel like mostly both sides have strong populist bases that reject the. Uh, sort of militarized section of the Republican Party. So the, the the people like the Cheneys and so forth that gave you the forever wars and are stumping right now for hardcore intervention in Ukraine, things like that. So I think the voters have already said, like, we don't want to do that again. We, we remember we're, we're like all old enough to remember what that looked like. And I don't I don't really still this see is probably Liz- the number one most agreed on populist issue. Yeah, I would say is. Yeah, we're not interested in. Right. More so. Of that. Just to be just to remind everybody, one of the reasons that Donald Trump remained popular is because he was like, I don't want to get involved in foreign policy at all. I want right. to just be completely like I want like I want to put all the oars back in the boat and and really kind of campaign on this utterly isolationist strategy, which is very popular amongst conservatives and progressives alike. And Liz Cheney represents the no fly zone section of the Republican party, right? right. The, we got to do something. And like, the, I don't, there's a, I think she believes in that. I think there's also a very disingenuous section of the Republican party that would just say that because it's not what Joe Biden wants to do. But I think she does want war. I think she would absolutely start a, happily start a war in a European theater because that's what she was trained to do by her father. Let's talk about civility now. Thank you very much. That leading to civility because Liz Cheney yeah. seems to be the person who wants to be the face of that or whatever. Um, Jack Danforth can shut the fuck up. I'm done. I don't know this guy very well. He's new to me because I didn't live in. I, you know, I've, I'm from here. Left at 15, moved back at 36. The 46, excuse me. So I was gone for 30 plus years. So I was gone during the solidly gone during the uh, the Danforth years. And to see him have the audacity of like we need and and you know we he's have to the, learn to respect one another as human beings regardless of political views. Well, which, how? by the way, I agree with, but yeah, I also but, am not the person who thought Josh Hawley would be the right choice for senator. And he's saying that on a Zoom call right. with the woman that Josh Howley defeated yes. by those four points that we just mentioned. Yeah. So, first of all, shout out to Claire during her this thing, at least when she's quoted, where you know, of course, I didn't watch the Zoom thing. Um, she says, like, he's talking about 
the race as if it's somehow equal on both sides. Like you gotta both get sides, away from these extremists in yeah, the government. Right. Yeah, and That's Claire's like none of the people who so he's right. All of the people running on the on the Republican side of the Senate race yeah. are extremists. A hundred percent. Absolutely. So he's trying to make a both sidesms argument that like well, we have to we both have problems. And Claire's like, no, bro, we don't. Not right now, bro. Like she totally right. shut it down. She was like, "She said I was no the moderate." Yeah, I yeah, was the moderate. She, People who supported yeah. Holly were surprised at what they got, and I mean that. Yeah, that the piece on and the she, Missouri Independence has a point of reference to Danforth, and she's and it, they're right. It was a direct jab, and it should have been. And she wait, hold on. So, so, uh, so in suggesting his plan, Danforth said both political parties represent the extremes, but McCaskill said, "quote Candidates on the Democratic side are not extreme." Like Mike and that's Trump, true. it's true they're not. Like you, like there's there's kind of d- shades of differences, and I actually think that one of the problems with the Democratic Senate primary is that they all need more money. Yeah. Like only one of them has, or two of them really have, like really well funded races. I think, I think like as much as I don't agree with the action or the line that, that Koontz is headed down. Like, do I think he would be a better Senator than how, of course I do naturally. Of course I would. Of course I do. Of course I think he would be a better choice than Vicki Hartzler, or any of these other lunatics. So I have to shout out to her that she has a very different take on what she means by civility. Right. And I think what she means by civility is like, Jack, your party has lost its mind and its way. Right. And How is it, this this is something that I always say, that when old, white, former Republican lawmakers have the audacity to tell Democrats and liberals that it's our responsibility to go find a Republican and, like, like take a Republican to work day or whatever he's suggesting, like, (laughs) go have lunch with a Trump voter and talk to him. Dude, that's what I do every day. I go see my dad. Like, what... (laughs) <laughs> How do you think my whole life is gone? <laughs> like, do you think that the times before when like my family has been like making fun of me for voting for Democrats, which happens every single time politics comes up or it used to. Right. And at some point I was like, I'm going to walk out of the house. If you guys don't shut up, they were like, okay, we're, we're fine. You're right. right. So when the, I'm going to throw it to you, Sean. So when the conversation on one side is essentially, We'd really like for this to be better. And the conversation on the other side is, oh, you want to cry in a coffee mug? Right. That's like, right. I'm sorry. And that's I know right. that's reductive. And I'm not saying well, that's, that's what how it... everybody does it. But it's so McCaskill poses the question. So why are those who demonize others so successful? Sean, that, that's that's where like take. Yeah. That. I mean, there's a lot of reasons where, you know, that these sorts of qualities of today's politics are here. And that's true. For a few reasons. One is that people don't understand what's going on on the issues a lot of times, partly yeah. because there's a lot of misinformation from interested parties and not necessarily and always political you know, highlighting parties. Last week, right, we, we had a couple of those like really simple factual errors in some of the stuff we were talking about because it's really hard to keep it all straight. Like right. it's really hard because there's a ton of bullshit out there. Right. So people, voters – which are the audience for politicians, they make their decision based on, do I think this person would approach a situation the same way I would? And they want to get a feeling for whether the person kind of thinks the same way that they do. And if they don't give a shit about tariffs or whether tampons are hit with sales tax, you know, then they're not going to read about the issues. So they are going to be subjected to tons of money in terms of advertising though. And so the demonization, like when you're putting your coalition together, that number of people who will not vote for the other candidate because they find them unacceptable, that's like a really important number for your campaign in terms of getting to a win. And so it's, those are specific reasons why we're there. You know, it has this electoral component. It has this uh, qualitative component with how voters think, um, and the, the money that pushes the message. Um, you know, the yeah. amount of money that Josh Hawley spent on Claire McCaskill and that race, you know, the one issue that he talked about, I think was just a complete lie. You know, he yeah. just said, I did not <laughs> vote to repeal protections for people with pre-existing conditions. And right. he did. And all the rest of the $130 said, million said, dollars. He also said, ads, like, I yeah. support pre-existing conditions. Like it's a, like it was a lane. Like, right. what is that? What right. does that even mean? Like, I'm totally I down people, pre-existing conditions think people are fine with me. Okay, great. Yeah. Like, yeah. I remember him saying that during the debate and I was like, 
Okay, so now pre-existing conditions but, is like a pull position that's meaning. Okay, go ahead, Sean. Sorry. So, so Sean, yeah, you, and, you, yeah, you yeah. highlighted this other article, and I want to pivot to that before we close out about the the radicalism among uh, white American Christians, and that we're seeing this. You know, it sort of flows into that same thing of you know Claire saying, "Why is it that the folks who demonize others are so successful?" And that's very much what we see here with this 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 Christian supremacy. Uh, issue and their attack going directly at voting rights, essentially. The, the conversation that's happening about all these voting laws of access to the ballot laws and, you know, the the fake fight against voter fraud, you know, this is all about minority rule and like the quote unquote right people voting. And they, you know, that that segment of the Republican Party has a ton of influence. Um, but yeah, that's where I'll leave it for myself. So yeah, Rachel, think- yeah, why did you bring that article? Well, I mean, it, it, I knew it was going to fit into what we were talking about as far as like, why does meanness and where does this lack of civility come from? And Sean's right that uh, there is, it, th- I'm not saying that every Republican is a racist human being. I'm saying that the bulk of racist voters happen to sit on that side of the aisle. It's just how America has been demographically shaped, partly yeah. for by age. And region, and the Republican Party has taken a hostile stance towards efforts to combat racism. You know that's absolutely true. Right. That's right. That's so, right. So, yeah. so when your so when your party's main threads are "Don't make me wear a mask," vaccines don't fucking work, mandates are stupid, the government can't tell you what to do with your body, but women can't have abortions, and also, by the way, there is only one religion, and they're taking your religion away from you. Um, and the only thing that we children, children can't be taught in school about anything anymore. We're going to ban books that mention anything to do with black people. Like it's also performative. Right. Right. And it is because like, apparently racism really helped Donald Trump win the election. I don't think there's any question that that's true for, for people that still who comment on this stuff from the, um, from the comfort of living in a solidly blue state. Uh, yeah. And I mean, New York and California, when they talk about like the disaffected Trump voter as if there's some like, you know, hard scrabble, you know, dirt under their nails, working in a coal mine, blah, 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 people. Yeah, there's, there's, there is that. But you know what else? There's mostly conservative suburban white voters who just look at takers. And that's right. been the language of the Democrat, of the Republican Party since I was a child. This idea that there were welfare scammers and that everybody takes from the system and that you're a hardworking tax paying American and that anybody who doesn't like, I mean, my father, again, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I keep picking on my dad. I love my dad. My dad's a great guy. And I, you know, like he's, he, he's a good father and all that, but he wouldn't listen to me when I told him that the affordable care act was why my husband got a lung transplant. Like he couldn't hear it. Like it, it was like, it could not get through the cognitive dissonance of right. people that are on the affordable care act are all just cheats. Right. And I was like your daughter right. and if you her take husband anything from the government. Yeah. You're yeah. a bad person. And so the, 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 the hard right turn that everybody took after nine 11 has turned into this just kind of rage bubble. Yeah. And it's the rage bubble has now been codified and embraced by the rank and file Republicans in the house for sure. And while I don't think it's as embraced as hardcore on the Senate side, they won't do anything to, to like pry it away from the party. They say they will. Yeah. They say they're just, they're just like kerfuffled by it. You know, Mitch, every once in a while McConnell will say something <laughs> and, you know, Mitt Romney may make a stump speech for Liz Cheney and be like, we have to get back to decency by doing nothing to actually stop the things that are indecent. Right. Anyway, back to you, Liz. So, you know, I don't, I, I'm not really even sure where to end with this, except to say that um, uh, I, I'm i starting to look at state parties on the Republican side. So the, the state Democratic parties in places like, you know, Missouri and West Virginia and places are probably just like throwing their hands up and like, we're done. Like their, their, their committees are all folding and nobody has any money and they can't get anybody to win. And so they're kind of more exasperated, but I really look at people like the um, extremists in the Missouri Republican house and the extremists in the Missouri Senate, which is pretty much all of them. Now there's not that many moderates left. And when, what Adam just said is really important to keep in mind that we can't, we could not keep track of the 
anti-education bills. We could not keep track of the anti-abortion bills because there are so many. And to me, that is an act of terrorism. It's state-sponsored, party-codified terrorism. The whole point of terrorism is to disrupt, to create fogs of war, to confuse people, to create division, to force people to um, basically to, to cause civil war is essentially one of the points of terrorism, right? Yep. And it's working. That's I don't know what else to say. Like I, it's like it's working. It's being successful. It's like it's it, the reason they they keep doing it is because it, it works for them. And they're not going. They don't know how to put the dog back on the leash. And I don't think they are trying that hard to do it. Sean, take us home. Well, and I think a lot of them are ready and want the civil war. Uh, you know. Amen. Totally. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Well, on that extraordinarily positive note, we'll close it out for the week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to both of you for joining me as always and have an awesome, wonderful uh, week. First week of spring. It's here. Spring is here. Uh, spring's today, you guys. It's going to get, it's at least like the cherry blossoms are coming. Let's be honest. Tweet us your Claire's daffodil birthday. Picks. She's turning Those should five be coming today. So, yeah. <laughs> Who's turning five today? Clara, our little, our oh, five-year-old. Five today. It's a birthday week. So, yeah, big birthday week. I'm the, I'm, I, we go 15th, 20th, 23rd. Uh, myself, Clara, and then my wife, and then the other two are in April. So we're heavy on the birthdays. So, yeah, be, it'll Happy be a fun week. Fun so week. fun. The Heartland Pod is a production of Midmap Media, LLC. Follow us on Twitter with at the Heartland Pod. With email, you can reach us, heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com, online with heartlandpod.com, subscribe, and please sign up for our Patreon with patreon.com slash heartlandpod. Become a podhead or an official podgressive today and unlock all of our content. See you at the next show.